Talk, Movie Talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show. We give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is Mark Ellis. Welcome one and all to the best movie news show in the entire galaxy. My name is Mark. We have a bevy of news topics to get to, and that over there is Ashley Mova. She's going to tell you who's on the rest of the panel. You look lovely today. Thank, Thank you. you. That is the nicest thing you've ever said to me. We are on such good friends, least. both on camera and off camera. We are. That's right. The bestest of friends. Yeah, and as you can see, also here, host of Collider Heroes, John Schneider. Yeah, so they install that. That's the thing that it's makes sure check. you yeah, you can't leave the house at a certain yeah, time. Yeah, I or... get shocked if I talk too much on okay. the show. Well, I just, I was, it's beautiful. It looks lovely. Thank I just you. want to compliment you, oh, just you like guys, Mark did. This is so nice. Ashley, don't make me hit the button. <laughs> Don't spray me. Don't spray me. Oh, that's all gone. Okay. Also, you're a host of Giant Council, Christian Harlow. Aw. The little guy hates being introduced last. He's got to wait so long to talk. Hey, wake up. Hi. Hi. Good to see you, Christian. Schnapp, I am excited to have you guys on the panel. We do have a lot of awesome stories to get to, but we do have to kick off with the very sad news, the passing of a comedy legend. Tell us about it, Ashley. Gene Wilder, the legendary star of The Producers, Blazing Saddles, Young Frankenstein, Willy Wonka, and The Chocolate Factory, and other beloved classics, has passed away at the age of 83. His nephew, Jordan Walker Perlman, confirmed his death in a statement, saying the cause was from complications of Alzheimer's disease. He was at his home surrounded by family in Stamford, Connecticut. We here at Collider Video offer our deepest condolences to his family, friends, and to all the fans around the world. Mark, to celebrate Gene Wilder, let's start with your favorite performance by him oh man that is the toughest call that I will have to make all week because this thing hit me like a ton of bricks yesterday I love Gene Wilder since I was a little kid and got to see him in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory though I don't consider that a children's movie I don't consider it a family movie I just it's an all-time classic film and a large reason why is the performance of Gene Wilder even before he starred in Willy Wonka he was great on Broadway he actually has a small role in Bonnie and Clyde if you want to check mm. that out but I think that it's him in Young Frankenstein is the thing that gets me the most or I'm sorry uh Victor von Frankenstein, Frankenstein. Uh, as the the yeah. the grandfather of the iconic Dr. Frankenstein or the grandson it's one of those things where when I saw that movie, I was already steeped in like the naked guns and, you know, the top secrets of the world and things like that. And my aunt gave me Young Frankenstein and I, just, I was blown away by how funny the movie was and how great Gene Wilder was in that. He seemed like such a warm spirit. He was also great when he would pair with Richard Pryor in things like Stir Crazy and Silver Streak. And I'm listing a lot of his great movies, but he was such a great person on top of being a fantastic comedic actor. Uh, Christian, when you hear that Gene Wilder passed, what was the first film that came to your mind? Uh, first of all, I, I, I don't know if I, if I dislike a story more mm. than this. Oh. He's one of my comedy idols uh, campy and i were doing that q a yesterday and that's mm -hmm. how we found out about it and i just I, I was like no because he was just such a great talent and a guy that was taken too soon from uh, you know i didn't even realize that he was going through alzheimer's and right. it explains a lot why i hadn't seen him in, in so long but as far as his performances go yeah young frankenstein is the one that i love i remember i mean obviously willy wonka but you know you mentioned those richard Pryor team us but you left off see no evil hear no evil right, right i love that movie and there's just something there was just something about him just that natural gift that he had and you knew that it was, there's just some people they're just born with him mm -hmm. like that he was just born with him and you know he lost his wife gilda ratner a very a long time ago at a young age as well too a man was had gone through a lot of tough times but he was a, he was a the type of personality that I always remember out of the interviews afterwards when he used to talk about Ratner and just the positivity that he would have afterwards and and you never saw his sadness now obviously he was mm -hmm. going through but you never saw there was just something about it to, about him he was just this this very encouraging figure that you you rooted for and you wanted to see more of and yeah he just uh, it, it's it's tragic that we lost him this early Should yeah that? I mean years later he went on to write a lot of uh, fictional uh, love stories I didn't want to perform anymore, mainly because of the uh, increase in swearing and the R-rated nature of comedies. He felt that was like taking away from the performances, and that was the reason he didn't want to mm. do a lot of any any future films as he stopped slowly performing. But yeah, I gotta agree with you guys. Young Frankenstein, I see it once a year. It's one of my favorite comedies ever made, and it's mainly because of Gene Wilder, his delivery, 
just how his acting, his writing, he wrote Young Frankenstein. Such a super talent. Obviously, there's Stir Crazy, there's Blazing Saddles, there's a ton of other amazing films. And of course, Willy Wonka. It's like, and I said, good day, sir. Like, just certain. I'll <laughs> he had never a great forget. yell. Yeah. He had a great yell. My yell, blue blanket. Yeah. yeah. His yell, his laugh, <laughs> just certain. He could, look so, he could look a certain way and you'll start laughing. I mean, he brings you joy. So if you haven't seen any of these movies, we've said, do yourself a favor. See Young Frankenstein. See Blazing Saddles. Mm -hmm. See and see the producers. See a lot of the stuff he did with Mel, Mel Brooks. See his own personal stuff that he directed with Gilda Radner. There's a lot of stuff to look up and check out. Yeah, and something also to check out is he did a sitcom called Something Wilder in the in the mid-'90s, mm -hmm. and then he also did an Emmy-winning turn on Will & Grace. He started an episode of that. I think it was in 2003. I remember watching it and thinking, like, this guy is just, he still has it. He's mm -hmm. still a cut above everybody mm -hmm. else. A much-deserved Emmy nod for that performance. Then he did a lot of voiceover later in his career, but Gene Wilder, gone too soon at the age of 83. Thank you for all the memories and all the laughs. Ashley, let's try to move on. All right, Zombieland and Deadpool writers Rhett Reese and Paul Wernick currently have a ton of momentum behind them after coming off the hugely successful Deadpool movie. And now they are putting that momentum to good use with their next project, Zombieland 2. Speaking on AMC's Geeking Out with Kevin Smith and Greg Grunberg, the duo confirmed that the sequel is currently in the works and that they are meeting with Woody Harrelson to walk him through the script. Or at least it has yet to be set. Schnepp, do you think we'll finally get to see Zombieland 2? You know, I I loved Zombieland when it came out. I thought it was great. Uh, is it you, so a few years? Can we talk about the the cameo? Is that a spoiler? I think at this point, let it go. <laughs> don't do talk it. about no, it. No, do, do it. it. Bill Murray's in it, yo. No, I'm just Bam, kidding. Don't spoiler. say anything. What? Oh wait, no what? <laughs> All right. So anyway, you got to check this movie out. It's incredibly funny, and it's a great zombie comedy. It's one of the few zombie comedies that actually works. Is it too late to do Zombieland 2 after they tried doing their like Amazon kind of pilot that didn't really work? I know they were involved, but I don't think it's too late. If they can get the team back together, if they get everyone who's in the original one and it's 10 years later, I think that would be fantastic. So. What do you think, Mark? I mean, look, I'm looking forward to Zombieland 2 in the sense that I don't need this movie to have happened. I, I really don't ever need to see Zombieland 2. But if you're going to make it, I am going to be excited about it. In the vein that Schnapp said, like, I want to see Jesse Eisenberg and I want to see Emma Stone and everybody back. I want to see Woody Harrelson back for sure. He was my favorite part of the first Zombieland besides, of course, Bill Murray. Sure. Uh, and then if you, if, you, if you throw in another cameo in there, you pepper in some more fun. It, maybe there's a cameo by a couple Walking Dead cast members because there's oh, so be many zombies in the ether right now that Zombieland 2, it is something I would welcome. I don't necessarily need it, Christian, but it'd be fun to check out. Yeah, I don't know if I need it per se, but I think the other thing is, is it's risky. Uh, depending on how much money it's going to cost to make, it, you're right, Schnapp. It's like, it, it was it 2006 or 2007, yeah. one of those two? You know, it was, and it wasn't like a big blockbuster movie that made so much money. It was something that was very, uh, was liked by a lot of people, including yeah. myself. I really enjoyed the movie. It's, it's a lot of fun. But it might be a little too late. Um, that is being said, you could also put together a great trailer and with everybody else involved, and then you can say, wait a minute, this one looks pretty interesting, and you get that buzz back by creating a good trailer. But this is the, we were talking about, I don't remember which, which movie it was, but this is where if you're gonna make, if you're gonna take the risk on it, this has to be 10 times better than the first one. Mm. If you're gonna take a risk on this movie, it's gotta be so much better that people are just, people that are watching right now and just people at this table like, did you see that trailer for Zombieland 2? Totally. Oh my God, what a great idea to do a second one. I can't wait to see what they're gonna do with this one. Right now, it's like, well, should they do it? That's the mindset we're in, but yeah. let's see the trailer. If the trailer just comes out and it's like, that looks kind of similar to the first, it, it's not gonna, be worth it. What you're saying, I agree with because it's like we're in that, the, at least Zombieland is in that like almost, like, is it 10 years? I mean, cause close. I think it was like, like 2007. Like I a think. lot of these other sequels that have come out, like Ghostbusters, Independence Day, Zoolander, all these movies that come out like 15 or more years later yeah. than the movie, but are still trying to tie on or like, like be a reboot or a, like not a direct sequel, but like kind of a remake kind of thing. It doesn't really work. I mean, it also, it's kind of like if it doesn't beat the original, then it fails. Right. So, yeah, I mean, like to me, my question is why Zombieland 2? Are we going to get into like those four characters? What have they been doing for right. the last 10 That's years? That's what interests me. Yeah. It's less in the context of how the audience is going to react to waiting so long for a sequel. But it's, it's more interesting to follow these characters when they had been surviving in yes. this new world for years and years. Yeah. As opposed to like, oh, it's now it's been a month since the events of the last one. I actually like to have some time have already 
they pass before we get to see them again. Well, look at it like a television show, right? right? Let's say let's say that the first one was a great pilot. I'm like, ah, they don't need to ever make a series out of this thing. But then they do, and it's just a season finale. Mm-hmm. If the season finale is better than the pilot, sign me up. And Woody Harrelson should be living inside of a hostess, uh, you know, cupcake <laughs> plant where he's just he's surrounded by ding dongs and Twinkies. That would be amazing. Oh, wouldn't we all love to live like that? <laughs> all right, what's our next story, Ash? According to Mashable's Jeff Snyder, Electric Children director Rebecca Thomas has joined the short list of directors on Captain Marvel. She joins the previously reported names Whale Riders, Nikki Caro, seeking a friend at the end of the world's Laureen Scafaria, and regular Homeland Helmer Leslie Linka Glatter. The studio has set inside out co-writer Megla Falve and Guardians of the Galaxy co-writer Nicole Perlman to begin working on the script over a year ago, with Kevin Feige recently telling us to expect a director announcement at the end of the summer. Brie Larson will take on the title role that is set to land in theaters on March 8, 2019. Christian, thoughts on Rebecca Thomas directing Captain Marvel? Well, we got into the conversation last week, and you all know my thoughts of what I said originally, and I will tell you that the, the list that they're putting together overall is impressive. The team that they have have already put together is impressive. So I'm going to stick with that side of things today and say that everyone that is involved <laughs> inside of these lists so far are people that could be or should be directing or writing this movie. Uh, Feige obviously knows the story he wants to tell and he's going to be working with these writers. Marvel has been doing a great job of putting together these teams and it seems like they're doing it again. So I'm, like I said, I'm staying on that side of it today, and I think that everyone involved is is a, is a great name. Yeah, it's interesting to see the other projects that she is attached to, like The Little Mermaid and things like that, where there are these these big, you know, tentpole kind of projects mm. that she clearly is capable of handling. So it makes sense that she's on the shortlist for Captain Marvel. Uh, I agree with you, Christian. Until I see them make a huge mistake somewhere in choosing a director or a writing team, then I'm going to say, okay, well, if Marvel thinks this is a good idea, I think we should be on board with it until we're proven wrong. Is that how right. you feel, Sean? Uh, yeah, I mean, as far as this new new uh, name added, I'm not familiar with her work. I haven't seen her film yet, but I mean, I'm still sticking with like <clears throat> at least I feel the safe bet and the good choice of the Homeland director because mm-hmm. she's got such an amount of uh, television work behind her and you know it, on her resume, I think she, that it's a good fit. Um, yeah, so I, you know, it's great to see another edition. I can't wait to see who they're going to pick, and I love that uh, Nicole Perlman's writing it. All right, well, we probably couldn't buy or sell who's going to be directing Captain Marvel just yet, but it is time for that segment, so now Ashley's going to give us the topic, and we'll say whether we buy it or sell it, and then probably get in a hissy fit. What's up first? According to a report from THR, Hitman Agent 47 producer Adrian Ascaria and Silver Fox Entertainment's F.J. DeSanto are teaming to develop and produce adaptations of a slate of high-concept comics by writer and graphic designer Tim Daniel. The titles being developed include The Atoll, about an Olympic athlete who is kidnapped and forced to combat a 21-foot great white shark. What? Fisher, which tells of a young couple living in a Tex-Mex border town who must contend with a mysterious force that is slowly devouring the town along with other titles. No writers or directors have been attached to the project. Mark Byersell movie adaptations based on the line of all comics. It's the biggest buy of all time. Did you guys not hear that? An Olympic athlete has to fight a great white shark. Cody Miller is going to have to fight a great white shark. (laughs) This is what I want to see. I'm sure animal rights groups will have a lot to say about the premise of this movie, but if I was a Bond villain, I would have a collection of great white sharks, and I would kidnap people and make them fight their way out. That sounds awesome to me. Now look, you can say what you want about Hitman Agent 47, that movie that came out, I believe, last year. Mm -hmm. Didn't do so well critically or at the box office, but with original premises like this, if the budget is within reason and you have a good story to back it up, I tend to think that it'd be nice to have some comic book films that feel more original than all this stuff that we already are aware of like Marvel and DC brings us. Even though those films are very exciting, it's nice to see a smaller guy come up on the block. What's your take, Schnapp? I think it's a, it's a good move. These comics haven't come out yet, but all the comic ideas sound interesting. I know Adrian personally, and I also know FJ. I think the team that they're they're assembling is a cool move, and I'd like to I'd like to see something that's different. It's not all p- guys in capes and like superhero. Even though it's a comic book, it's a different medium. It's a di- they're t- it's science fiction and fantasy. That's what they're concentrating on in their vault comics line. So I think it's like a cool move to see a producer taking an early step into doing something like this. Christian? So I buy it. 
it, by the way. What do you got? I'm also going to buy it, and I'll tell you why. Uh, Adrian's one of my favorite people working in this town right now. He's been right on now. this show. He's, been on, he's a friend of the show, but the thing is that the reason why is the guy takes risks. Mm -hmm. um, and he knows, I've talked to him many times, he knows my thoughts on Hitman. I am not a fan of that movie. I mm -hmm. think it's pretty, not, not great. Um, right. I've talked to him about the, these <laughs> about these things. Too, and what he, and he, with Adrian, he goes after new ideas. He tries to go, and with Hitman, it's a kind of a passion thing to where he was always trying to bring that movie. Sure. Say what you want about it. It's a matter of what are you doing next? Are you doing brand new things? And like you said, Chef, these haven't come out. They're new ideas. They're different ideas. He's going. He's, they're they're trying to go away from just doing from other people who are doing like the Marvels and the DCs. He's bring, like We're talking about it every day in the show. Original ideas, brand new things you don't know. And so they're taking a risk. Hopefully, they take the risk and they put together some good filmmakers in it and they put together the right actors to do it and that we're raving about it. And then that that then it can all come to fruition that way. So I hope that this. This is something that pays off. It's a good risk, so we'll see what happens. Uh, three buys across the board, and we're getting a lot of fans in the chat room saying that Ryan Lochte should be the one that has to fight the great white <laughs> and shark lose. first. We'll no. see. Hey, he, could, he might lie about what went down when he's fighting <laughs> right, the shark, right, but right. maybe he ends up defeating what it. What if it was the, huge. the great white baby. shark is like controlled by a, the evil villain? He's like, I am yeah. inside the brain. It's like a VR shark. Like, he made I'm Lochte lie. Yeah. yeah. It's I a buy shark's fault. the story. I'm starting to sell some of our ideas. <laughs> yeah. Man, it'd be fun to check yeah. out. The Great What's White a, Lie. The Great White Lie. Yeah, that's the movie. Yeah. The Great yeah. White yeah. Lie. Yeah. All right. It just <laughs> happened. <laughs> yeah. And now, regretfully, we have to move on to okay. another story involving less sharks. All right. According to Variety, Modern Family star Julie Bowen has joined New Line's Life of the Party, portraying the enemy of Melissa McCarthy's lead character. <laughs> Life of the Party has already snagged a prime summer release date of May 11, 2000. 18. McCarthy will star and produce while her husband Ben Falcone directs. The project is being described as in the vein of Rodney Dangerfield's Back to School. Christian Byers sell Julie Bone in the life of the party with Melissa McCarthy. It's not that I'm selling Julie Bone because I happen to like her. I'm selling this movie, selling it. I don't want to hear about it ever again and I'll tell you why. I really like Ben Falcone. I like him a lot. I think he's a really talented guy. It is not working with him directing Melissa McCarthy. It's just not working. They they did the boss. He directed the boss. down by life. Every time. I rooted for them. I thought Tammy was going to be one of the biggest hits of the summer, and I looked like a moron for saying that. that movie was atrocious with a capital A. It is a bad movie. They don't. It's. It's just they're too close together. They're too. It, it, they don't work together. It just does not work. The directing when they're acting together. The little scenes that they've done, whether it be Bridesmaids or even, the, I can't remember the last movie that they the did. Boss? Together. Maybe. I think he direct that one, though. He did. Oof. Um, so <laughs> I'm just saying, it's it's when they're together working as acting and actress, it's good. They're funny. They have good chemistry. There's just something about the directing team. It's not working for me. But Julie Bowen, fine. I, just, I don't care about this movie. I'm going to buy it. Oh. It's a slight buy. And it, it's less that I believe in, in Bell Falcone, Ben Falcone directing Melissa McCarthy, because you're right. It's They've had one and a half misses. And why I say this, because the first half of The Boss, I was rolling. I thought it was great. Then there's one scene in that movie that totally ruins the rest of the film. It takes you so far out of the movie, you can't get back in. So I can pin that on the director. But the involvement of Julie Bowen, I think it's going to be an interesting dynamic between her and Melissa McCarthy going at each other as potential rivals in the same vein that it was Christina Applegate versus Mila Kunis in Bad Moms, which is a movie that pleasantly surprised me. So I'm going to buy the fact that Julie Bowen is going to take that mantle of being the nemesis to Melissa McCarthy. I like that angle of it, even if the movie as a whole, I'm still a little nervous about. How do you feel, Schnapp? You know, I'm going to buy it just because I've been watching Vice Principals on HBO, and I like that. So if this has any flavor of that kind of... directing like, that? No. Oh. I'm just... Okay. It's a totally. Uh, it's no. just school in related. Oh. It's back to school related okay. in very tangential ways. But I'm buying it because I like Melissa McCarthy, and I and I haven't seen Tammy, and oh. I haven't seen the boss. Okay. So I don't have that built-in okay. hatred towards this okay. Falcone fella. Makes sense now. So I'm willing to give him the three strikes are out. You guys can. You already have the two strikes. I'm. Just, I'll see this one. I swear. But do you have <laughs> enough faith in a back to the school remake or, or, or back to school? You know, reimagination. Yes, I do. Back to school. You guys haven't seen it. It is hysterical. It's Rodney Dangerfield in his prime. A very young Robert Downey Jr. You get a lot of that. 
<laughs> and you get Sam Kinison in one of the better oh cameos goodness. I've ever seen. But yeah, you're not going to get another Sam Kinison, but I, no. I, I'm looking forward to see Mel seeing Melissa McCarthy's take on this. So that's why I'm buying. Mm. All right. Well, something I'm looking forward to since about 11.09 this morning when John Campiel let us know that something very interesting happened on Instagram, and that is going to be an added buy or sell. And for that, we go to, I guess, back to me, because Mark Hamill wrote something very interesting on Instagram, and the gist of it is that he is wrapped with episode eight. Haven't seen my chin since May 2015, so hashtag farewell facial fur and hashtag bye bye beard at least till episode nine. What? what? So, Christian, is this Mark Hamill just yanking our chain a little bit and having some fun with us? Or do you think this is actual confirmation that Luke Skywalker makes it out of episode eight alive? Who's to say he makes it out alive? He could still be a force ghost with a beard. Oh, there uh, you go. Yeah. There you go. Rooting for people to die. I'm just saying, I'm not saying that. I, I actually don't think he'll die in episode. Eight, but don't doesn't mean. Are you buying it or selling it? I'm gonna what <laughs> buy that he's what what's the buy? It, it, I think the buy or sell here is whether Luke Skywalker appears in Episode Nine. Oh, I'll buy it. Yeah, I think that it makes sense for for you got to have Luke in all three of the movies, whether or not he's a Force ghost or whether he's not. I I happen to think he'll make it all the way through. Um, he may die at the end of Episode <gasps> Nine, maybe not. But uh, I will say that I think that it, it's not that big of a reveal because I think that you need him. I think yeah. that you're gonna need him now. I think that this also means don't bet on the fact that Carrie Fisher is going to make it out of episode eight. Mm. I think that I'm just telling you. Now you're killing people we're not even talking about. I was talking about Han Solo eating it for about two years, and everyone said, Can't be told me I was nuts. He wasn't going to die in seven. You said it wasn't going to happen didn't in seven. You want to see it. I'm not telling you want to see it. I'm just saying it makes sense to start dropping these characters off, doing it the right <laughs> way. <laughs> doing it the right dropping way. Dropping them off. They're dropping yeah. them off. Well, they get, you're it's out. like they're like, you know, in a little the, delivery thing. Out. Drop you. Because it's introducing the new characters getting us used to them first totally. taking it like unlike what independence day two did mm. this the, this movie is going to it introduce you we care about finn now we care about ray and now then you're going to start we lost han we'll probably lose Leia, and we'll probably lose luke but i think it makes sense for the journey that they're going to tell that luke will be in episode all eight. right snap uh christian made a number of missteps in my book first of <laughs> all he equated uh, a character dying to getting out of a car and then he also <laughs> said that luke skywalker or carrie fisher's okay. princess Leia might not make it through episode nine do you think that Luke Skywalker is going to appear in Episode Nine by herself. Look, can we just talk about Chewbacca and his feelings for a little bit? <laughs> That's right. I is mean, he look, making it out? Oh, yeah, he'll be all right. Leia you can't owes kill him the dog. a hug. Can't she owes him, him a hug at the very beginning of this movie. <laughs> right. There should be a hug, right. and they, there should be a few scenes of uh, of Chewbacca mourning. That's what I think. But uh, I think if Carrie Fisher dies, will she be in Nine as a Force ghost? Because she's part Jedi. But I don't think she knows how to. I don't think she's been training that long. Uh -huh. All right. Um, I don't think Luke's going to die. <laughs> I have no idea. This little boy's yeah, no, I, don't know. I didn't Sorry. thought she was already a Jedi I or something. Yeah. I don't think he's going to die either. I, I, I hope not. I mean, I'm buying that you're definitely going to see Luke Skywalker yeah. in Episode Nine, even if they somehow made the huge mistake of killing him in Episode Eight, that he would appear as a Force Ghost. Like, I, I think there's going to be a number of Force Ghosts in Eight and Nine. I think you're yeah. going to see Obi Wan. Mm. Then you're going to see Yoda. I think you might even see uh, Darth Julius Vader as a Force Ghost somehow, whether it's Hayden Christensen or whoever else it is. But if Luke was to fell by somebody's sword, I think he will come back as a Force Ghost. This story just reminded me that John Campio owes me a steak dinner still. Oh. Oh, hey, here's another buy or sell. If Luke Skywalker dies in eight and comes back in nine as a force ghost, does he have the beard as a ghost or is he beardless? Oh, he ghost? have a beard. I mean, Obi Wan still had his beard. But what if he decided to shave? Can't while he's shave a force as a ghost. ghost. It's part of the rules. What? Do you, what part what? of the rules? Hey, I'm just telling you. All right, all right. Segment, right? I didn't know that. To you by our friends at Harry's Razors, <laughs> and now we go on to opening this week. Brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. What do we have in theaters this weekend, Ashley? The Light Between Oceans, a couple, Michael Fassbender, Alicia Vikander, who reside in an Australian lighthouse, discover a baby in a boat along with a dead body. They decide to raise the child, a choice that leads to devastating consequences. Also coming out is Yoga Hosers. Two 15-year-old yoga enthusiasts, Lily Rose Depp, Harley Quinn Smith, join forces with a legendary manhunter, Johnny Depp, to battle Canadian Nazis who take the form of deadly sausages. 
Uh, <laughs> deadly sausages is something that, of course, I think we all are very intrigued about. <laughs> now, uh, Schnepp and Christian, you guys have both seen yoga hoses. Yeah, and light between the oceans. So yes. we'll talk about oh, the sorry. light between the oceans. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> so tell, sell me on yoga hoses before you sell me on light between the oceans. I can't sell you on yoga hoses. You're either going to love this movie or you're going to hate this movie. It's 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 one of the, you got to go into this movie. Uh, even hearing you hear Ashley read it, it's ridiculous mm-hmm. all the way through. And Kevin Smith knows he made a ridiculous movie. He made the movie for himself. He made it for some friends. Um, <laughs> what what she just read is exactly what it is, and it's got like that kind of Ferris Bueller, John Hughes type thing going on with gremlins. It's it's absolutely insane and that's he, high praise i mean if it gets anywhere it's, near either it's one not of those they're vibes. not it's not at the level but there's certainly tones from it he took he took inspiration from it and he made he probably was you know stoned out of his mind one day and said hey you know what that'd be funny to have these sausages running around and do this and hey, i'll put my daughter in i'll do this i'll put my friends in it ah, i made a movie it's fun and he pretty much says as much when he, i saw the movie at sundance with him explaining it and some people walked out some people had a blast with it <laughs> it's one of those movies it's not it, you i i can see people that see this movie and say I hated it and thought it was the dumbest thing other I could see some people who watched this movie and said I had a blast with it it was exactly what I was expecting for this movie and you know it's, it's one of those movies uh, Schnepp which is the better sausage coming to life movie would that be sausage party or the releasing this week yoga hosers I still have not seen sausage party so I still have to see that but I saw yoga hosers at uh, New York uh, sorry uh, San Diego Comic Con I loved it. People who walked out on this movie, take the corn cob out of your butt. I mean, because you got to just chill out, enjoy the film. It's a super weird, a billion genres click together. It's Smith having fun. I I could not stop laughing once it once we got through the Degrassi high part of the movie, and then we went into sheer weirdness and surreal madness. I I literally almost peed my pants when Ralph Garman. Ralph took, Garman is so good. When in that movie, and he yeah. literally did. Especially you must have appreciated the hell out of this. I don't want to ruin yeah, it. Yeah, we're not ruining anything, but. My God, I literally, I think I laughed for 15 minutes yeah. solid, almost I, oh, definitely wow. tears from that moment, from the beginning of Ralph Garman all the way to the end. Yeah. I, I found it really satisfying on a completely bonkers, crazy nutcase, insano film, is, yeah. a weird smashing of styles, but I thought it worked. And it's like, people just have to chill out, man, yeah, but, have well, some fun. But the thing is, you can see that you, that's it's not for everybody's taste. You you and I both have that kind of weird taste and can, mm-hmm. uh, it's not, there's some people that just don't have that type of taste. And I can see where they'd be like, I don't want to know, I don't want to know those <laughs> Well, they're like a little bit like, I, I don't think I could laugh at this. Get well, out of here. As somebody that's been accused of having a tiny corn cob up his butt from time to time, I am very much looking forward to seeing Yoga Hosers. Uh, we all have checked out The Light Between Oceans, and mm. it's one of those movies where as soon as the movie came on when we were at the screening, I was like, oh, okay, we're out of the summer blockbuster disappointment season, and now we're into Oscar contention. Regardless of if you think this movie is an Oscar contender, it has that style and that sheen for sure. You have two great stars, Michael Fassbender and Alicia Vick. Candor Derek St. Francis, the director, the way that him and the cinematographer went together and just got all of these gorgeous looking shots. It involves a lot of heavy subject matter. I mean, you have mm-hmm. a you have a baby, you have adoption in there, you have uh, somebody claiming to be the real mother coming into the picture. There's a lot of heavy things, but I think it's worth checking out if you brace yourself and maybe bring a box of tissues with you. What do you think, Schnapp? I didn't cry at all. It wasn't emotionally engaging to me, and that's my biggest disappointment in the film. I felt that the uh, the the first uh, two hours of the film, I really can't talk about until the credits. <laughs> so, uh, would I would I uh, recommend it? Um, if you love melodramatic tear jerkers t- to a certain degree, I think Fassbender and Vikander are incredible actors, and they did an incredible job. Um, but I can't myself personally recommend it unless you love this kind of like melodramatic soap opery type of thing. It's really well shot. Um, but that's all I can say. Uh, Christian, you and I got to talk to Derek C. in France uh, last week on Schmoes. Uh, what did you get the vibe from him about making this movie? My favorite line that he said when we got to talk to him was that he's a documentarian of fiction. I yeah. loved that that quote. And it was one of the m- most fun interviews and just engaging interviews that, that we've ever done, I thought, because you just hear his perspective on filmmaking and working with actors. And you see that in this movie for sure. It's a movie that I think that if you're a C. in France fan you should definitely go and check it out if you're a filmmaking fan you should go and check it out um it's a movie that like like mark said it's in, it's under embargo at the moment so we can't really get too deep into it but it's a movie that is it's beautiful 
for sure. It's a movie that you should check out for great performances. And um, yeah, it's you know it's the same thing again. Not for everyone. Right. It's a, if you don't, it's it's deep. It it, it definitely plays with emotion for mm -hmm. sure so if you if you're not going into that movie and you don't want to see tragedy then you shouldn't see this movie but well the the director Derek San France actually he did stop by the studio when he did Schmoes he was also able to give an interview to us here at Collider and for a quick clip of that we turn it over to I guess Adam's going to hit play anyway he gave me a, they gave me a pile of books and the one, the one on the top was the light between oceans and I thought to myself well that's kind of a cinematic idea there like a lighthouse keeper I mean you know, what, what is cinema but a light shining through a lens and projecting into the darkness? Um, and so I said, let me, this is intriguing, so let me take a look here. And I started, uh, you know, reading the story, and it's about a man who lives on a lighthouse, on, on this island with his wife, and they share this great secret. And, you know, when I was a kid, I used to think people lived on islands. I used to think uh, my house was an island because when people would come over, I would always notice that we would change inside our house. We would act differently. We would become like the most charming versions of ourselves. And then people would leave and we'd go back to being real again. And I know when I go to friends' houses, the same thing would happen. I'd be down in their basement like playing pinball and eventually I'd hear their parents start to like, uh, they'd had too much to drink and I'd hear their parents start to, uh, you know, fight each other upstairs. And so I always had this idea from being a child that people were uh, lived on islands and that homes were islands and that families were places where great secrets were kept. And it's been kind of my mission as a filmmaker to tell stories, to make movies about those families and those secrets. And uh, and I'm always just trying to make home movies, really. Uh, movies about families um, and try to bring out that truth that happens on those islands. And so this was like a literal manifestation of that metaphor that I always imagined. And, you know, then, uh, you know, it dealt with similar themes, questions of paternity and, uh, you know, love between, uh, you know, between a husband and wife and kind of the, you know, the, the, what happens over the course of time to that love and, and legacy. And, and then, you know, eventually by the end of the book, I was on the sea train in New York City and I was, I was just in, in tears, you know, uh, because I felt it, found it to be so cathartic. And uh, it was embarrassing, honestly, to be cry, to cry. Have you ever cried in public? I have. I cried on the LIRR reading the end of Marley and Me. There you go. Yep. Yes. So I you, cried you some know? serious tears there on that train. Go. It was awful. It's embarrassing, right? It's the worst thing to cry in public. But I th the only the, the light at the end of the tunnel for me was that if any of those people on that crowded subway were reading what I was reading, I felt like they would be having the same experience. And I think it's good to have uh, kind of that emotional cleansing. That was director Derek Sanfrance being interviewed by our own Perry Nemiroff. And watching that interview got Schnapp a little emotional because I know you love The Place Beyond the Pines. Yeah, I just want to give a shout out to that film. If you haven't seen it yet, check that out. That's incredible I love filmmaking. That movie. Yeah. It's a great, strange way of telling a story that just has you through up from the very beginning all the way to the end. The Place Beyond the Pines. Ryan Gosling, when we meet him in that movie, wearing a Metallica shirt. That might have come up during our interview <laughs> with Derek in France. Now let's go to our good friend Wendy Lee, who's been monitoring you guys in the chat room all the live long day. And Wendy, there's one story that the kids cannot stop yapping about, and that would be this Mark Hamill Instagram post. What are they making of it in the chat? Oh, I think the chat blew up from the news. Uh, of course, everyone hopes to see Luke make it to episode nine. Jonathan Carroll says, by heart, at least Luke will survive, maybe. Uh, <laughs> Uter74 says, Mark Hamill knows what he's doing. He's being vague and not giving any info out. Super, since 1975, gives his uh, whole plot for the next movie. <laughs> Luke is not going to die until episode nine. Ray will kill him. Whoa. Kyla will kill Ray. Whoa. Kyla what? will return to the light side of the Force. And finally, some bro says, as a Jedi, when you die, make sure you had a good hair day. Don't want to spend the eternity looking goofy. Uh, wow. Some bro, you can some still get a haircut bro. in the force of, you know, barbershop. You know what? Judging from those comments in the chat room, I'm glad I'm not the only one that starts drinking before noon around here. Uh, <laughs> you know, before we go to mailbag, boys, there's something interesting. It's really up in the air as the weather. Luke Skywalker is going to make it out of episode eight alive. Christian, only one from this Friday Schmodown will continue to advance in the ultimate Schmodown tournament, which kicks off this Friday. Mark Riley, the former champion yep. going up against the Mountain Elliot Dewberry. Tell us a little bit more about the Ultimate Schmodown. All right, so the Ultimate Schmodown, if you guys didn't know, uh, Adam, can we grab that graphic up there? There it is. Okay, so there it is. That's the Ultimate Schmodown that tournament. You got Riley versus Dewberry happening. Then the week after that is Mark Ellis versus Sam Levine. Yay, that's, that's right. 
followed that's by great. myself going up against the outlaw John Roca, and then Clark Wolf going up against Josh Makuga. That is the ultimate showdown. The winner plays the champion Dan Merle in December when we do the Schmodown Spectacular, which is pretty much like our WrestleMania. That'll happen in December. But here's the thing. So you guys, if you're brand new to the Ultimate Schmodown, you don't know what's going on with that. We do something for you guys. So you will do your brackets. You will submit your brackets to this email, sk. 2016 at gmail.com sk down 2016 at gmail.com right there you submit your bracket however you have to put your name and your address in there right away when you submit it submit your poll at the end of the tournament if you get a perfect bracket you're going to win a grand prize what is it that will be announced on the schmoes but it'll be something special maybe some blu-rays maybe some posters it's going to be a lot but you have to get the perfect bracket so again sk down 2016 at gmail.com there's the bracket one more time adam if you please and there we go there it is that's your bracket and myself john campia mark riley and clark wolf will be doing a special tournament breakdown video today on the channel look for that a little bit if you want to get a little insight on the tournament before you do your brackets uh, i love elliot dubair to death he's a good buddy i don't know that he can hang with a with a caged animal known as mark riley, riley this needs to win riley he's needs upset to win. about how things have gone down recently for him so i think he comes back strong uh, i would dumb question really quick yes. so sk down 2016 at gmail.com is the email yeah. and when they write it they have to write their full name and then their email address or add their actual no, home they're address. actually address, their actual for, address for when the, the prize the prize actually is sent to them right so they're gonna if, if they win they gotta get the perfect bracket though all right good mm. luck kids i would love to say bet on ellis but my god that's a tough looking field yeah. so <laughs> we'll see what happens and now we move on to mailbag quick reminder at the end of this show we're gonna save a couple minutes for your live twitter questions go ahead and start tweeting us right now at collider video and in the meantime we got two mailbag questions what's up first miss ashley noontide writes greetings collider crew i understand that making a film is a huge undertaking with lots of people involved in order to produce a final product but oftentimes we hear of a director walking out on the project during a film's production such as lynn ramsey in the jane got a gun film and sometimes the director's behavior was so unprofessional or erratic that it ultimately hurt the final product josh trank in the fantastic four reboot if you believe the onset accounts of his behavior, what ultimately is the price for the director and the studio when such drastic behavior and changes occur during the production of a film? Love your show. Keep up the great work. It's a great question. And unfortunately, it is one of those that you answer that it's on a case by case basis. So sometimes if you have a director and he flips out on somebody on set, like if it's like David O. Russell sometimes in, in his past has been rumored to maybe even throw a punch sometimes that he gets angry, he gets he gets intense, he yells at people that might be easier to clean up than something like a director walking off set and having nothing to do with the movie. Christian, a lot of times you also hear reports about how directors were on set for principal photography and then they get locked out of the editing room so they can't even finish chopping up their own yeah. movie. Is it as easy to say as it's just you got to look at it case by case? Yeah, it is case by case for sure because it's also status of the director. It's also reputation of the director. So, some, listen, but sometimes things happen. You know, sometimes right. it, there might just be two people who don't get along, and something happens. Or maybe people that uh, before that particular movie had great reputations, and then a circumstance happens, and they don't see eye to eye, and it's disaster. Sometimes it's the studio's fault. Sometimes it's the director's fault. Like you said, case by case. Sometimes there's a movie that's really good, and the director doesn't want his name on. Look at American History X. Right. Um, so there is there is sometimes that it. It, it just depends. It just all, you never you never know what's going on inside people's heads. You never know what's going on in the studio. So it's just it's a working environment where you work. There's things that happen that crazy stuff goes down with the hierarchy and it, yeah, it's always crazy stuff. Uh, Schnapp, when it comes to drastic behavior on set or in post production of a movie, what is the ultimate price that either the director or the studio is going to have to pay? Well, back in the olden days of like 15, 20 years ago, directors would take their name off and just replace it with Alan Smithy. You might see yep. seen a bunch of movies with the name Alan Smithy. That means the director took their name off because they were either didn't, were embarrassed by the film, were fighting with the actors or the producers, and just didn't want their name on it. Some guy named Alan Smithy just get a bunch <laughs> of residual checks? Yep. Unfortunately, no. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, and also... It's the, Shep's real name. Yeah, the, my name is Alan Smithy. Uh, the unfortunate thing is uh, if, you put your if you take your name off, you lose a lot of your residuals. So a lot of directors nowadays will keep their name on even if they've been removed from the film. Um, there's a price to pay when a lot of these things happen. Obviously, uh, 
that bad word of mouth affected the Fantastic Four, you know, the couple of weeks before it got released when all this dirty laundry started getting released. We'd heard about Jane Got a Gun, the, the problems with that. You can go all the way back to like certain films like uh, Michael Cimino's uh, Heaven's Gate, or is it Cimino? I always say his name wrong. Whatever. But, uh, you know, I mean, his film was originally supposed to cost 18 million, went up to 75 million. It was like literally he was in director's jail for quite a long time because he was blamed for this incredible costly bomb. So that's what happens nowadays. It's like you kind of go go away. Maybe it's like if you're directing television shows, you have to you sit in a corner for a while, maybe direct a couple of TV shows or a low budget movie to get get your name back, sort of so to speak. All right. And for our last mailbag, let's go to outer space. What? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Jamcat writes, Hi there, Collider from the UK. <laughs> Been watching since John Sinister interview special at AMC. My question is, do you think that Guardians of the Galaxy is the new Star Wars? When the 2014 film came out, it was a groundbreaking event in film. I know for me, I have never enjoyed and been so utterly swept away by a film. When I sat down for my first screening and thought as soon as the film finished, I have to see this again at least another three times. Ended up seeing it five times. Do you share my thoughts? Well, Jamcat, I share your thoughts to a point that, yes, it was a lot of fun to see that movie, and as soon as it was done, I, too, wanted to go right back into the theater and ride that ride all over again. I will stop far short of calling it the next Star Wars simply because you're never going to get another Star Wars. It, you're never going to get an event that groundbreaking in the history of cinema, in the future of movies. You're never going to see something like the phenomenon that was Star Wars in 1977 and that snowballed into this thing that continues to live and breathe inside of all of us and around the galaxy. And it's nothing about Guardians of the Galaxy. I'm not trying to sell that movie or that franchise short or any of the Marvel films or DC films for that matter. It's just simply because Star Wars was something that hit so hard so quickly. It took the world by storm. And because of that reason, you will never see a movie hit like that. Like, I just knocked my Starbucks cup <laughs> over again. Can we take that back to one? No, we're live. Schnapp. Hey. Blooper, blooper. Hey, um, I think uh, to millennials or younger people, that is their Star Wars. To, to people who grew up with Star Wars and this, the power that, that those set of those three films had and the ramifications that they had that we saw directly as we grew up with them, that's totally different than someone who's like, you know, 15 or 18 right now, and they saw Guardians of the Galaxy three years ago, and it was like blew their mind. I, I could see why a lot younger people could could talk about this Guardians of the Galaxy as being their Star Wars, because they aren't as emotionally or directly connected to Star Wars as they are to this brand new thing that happened when they're alive, when it was in theaters, and it was their first time to experience something like that. So I don't fault anyone for saying they like Guardians of the Galaxy or it's their Star Wars. I just, because I grew up and I saw Star Wars in the theater when I was like nine, it to me it's like wow that uh that's never going to be my Star Wars because I've got Star Wars. Oh, yeah, it's totally cool if Guardians of the Galaxy is your Star... If Young Guns 2 is your Star Wars, then have at it. But I'm talking about from a from a worldwide impact. I don't think anything's ever going to touch what Star Wars did in 1977. No, it created the blockbuster also. Right. I mean, it really did. I mean, you can argue for for Jaws, but I mean, it, it really, Star Wars created Star the Wars blockbuster. Star Wars was the one. It yeah. was the one that started it. Um, but no, if you want to look in the perspective of it's my Star Wars and I feel the same way about Star uh, Guardians as you feel about Star Wars, and absolutely, like you said, the Young Guns, or whatever. You, JFK is your Star Wars. Okay, fine. It's like saying, it's like, saying like like Van Halen is my Beatles guy. Yeah, thing, sure, you know? sure. But uh, no, I just the, the difference also is that Guardians, what it do, what it did is that it it it's very it was very hard to do a space opera and not be compared to Star Wars. Correct. I mean, and Guardians did it. And they absolutely did it. And they did it in a pre-existing uh, universe, in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. They're going to be able to now, eventually, not in Guardians 2, but in the Avengers, they're going to kind of weave their way in and introduce us to other characters there, too. So I think they fit more into that overall. They're, they're the first of the cinematic universe. I mean, yeah. Marvel started that really, that big cinematic universe, and Guardians is, part, is a part of that. Star Wars is something else entirely it's granted they both have galaxies and different planets and things of that nature but there's just something more if you go to the campbell stories and everything else of what the way that lucas just took the initial story the hero story right. of what he did with star wars i just don't think guardians fits it at that moment i liked guardians i certainly didn't love it as much as you guys did and certainly as much as our, our viewer here did but i liked it and i'm excited for the second one and i am one of those guys because i just love space fantasy in general mm. and i want to see more of guardians but they're two different things completely. It's not the next Star Wars. And 
Star Wars isn't when they do Episode Eight isn't the next Guardians, right? And you also can't compare it to really Star Wars because no. Star Wars is its own entity that yep. had obviously a ton of inspiration from all these other genres well, that Samurai. George I mean, Lucas uh, was in, in Flash Gordon, all yeah. these other ins Buck inspirations. Rogers, yeah. yeah, so I mean, to see it's it's basically every single science fiction film since Star Wars has had elements of Star Wars sure. in it. So although I would love to see a fight between Rocket Raccoon and Biston the Space Monkey from Rogue One, that would be <laughs> epic. Get that on the screen. You don't know please. how Biston's gonna be. Biston's gonna be awesome. What, dude. what the hell is Biston? He's, Biston he's the, the space monkey. He's the little what? guy. What? Ah! He's, he's the one in yeah. the Rogue One. I say Salacious Crumb will beat them all. Yeah. That, I, that's not a bad call, actually. Ashley Moe, now let's do some live Twitter questions. Let's just do two and call it a day. Okay. Janine LC writes, what song, no matter when or where you hear it, do you always associate with a particular movie or movie scene? Oh, right. man. Well, I will pick up from my Young Guns 2 previous drop, mm -hmm. and I will say Blaze of Glory by Bon Jovi is one of those movies, or one of those songs where as soon as you hear it, you think about the movie. Mm. Power of Love uh, in Back to the Future. Um, and then, uh, you know, I can go way back and go Eddie and the Cruisers. I'll say Big Bottom whenever I hear it, of course, because it was recorded for <laughs> Spinal Tap. I will say it always reminds me and it puts a smile on my face when I think of 1983's This Is Spinal Tap. Schnapp, who you got? Is it cheating if I say John Williams Superman score? I think of Superman. A little <laughs> Besides that, I'm like Ride of the Valkyries, I instantly think of Apocalypse Now. Um, Go to you. Here I am stuck <laughs> in the middle with you. Yeah, I mean, Pulp I mean, I mean Reservoir, Reservoir, Reservoir Dogs. Dogs. Right yeah. away. And Eye of the Tiger, yeah. obviously. I mean, you can't hear Eye of the Tiger and I think of Rocky Balboa. Um, there's tons. I mean, there's so many. They, uh, which is the one? Bim. I think a platoon. That one song. Oh, uh, sure. Uh, uh, white uh, white Rabbit. Well, it's also mm -hmm. Tear, Tears of the Clown is also a platoon. Sure. White Rabbit, I think, was in a lot, every Scorsese movie. Uh, right. yeah, there's, there's tons. There's tons. Uh, Layla, too, by uh, by Derek and the Dominoes. Eric Clapton. Uh, Goodfellas. In Goodfellas. Yeah. yeah, that always reminds me of that. Uh, Sammy Hagar, Heavy Metal, from um, the movie yep. Heavy Metal. Mob Rules. I was about to say Heavy Metal. When I hear the Mob Rules song, I see those animated dudes coming down to murder the, t the city. God, we're such awesome. good friends. Yeah. All right, and our last Twitter question of the day is... Bittersweet Symphony, Cruel Intentions, one of my favorite movies. Ooh, yeah. nicely done, Ash. Um, all right. A lot of people are asking about this. Debbie Schechter wrote us and sent us a link to this article. Thoughts on Karen Gillan joining Jumanji? And The Rock did like a Instagram post, like a whole paragraph about her joining the oh, cast. Cool. Okay, well, thank you, Debbie. Debbie's a great fan. And uh, yeah, Karen Gillan, who is in the Guardians of the Galaxy right. universe, and then her joining the cast of Jumanji. Um, sure, doesn't really get me out of bed in the morning, but I, you know, I know you weren't the biggest fan of hers I was in the first Guardians. I was a fan of hers in Oculus, was not a fan of hers in Guardians at all. I thought she was the worst part of Guardians, to be completely honest with you. But I do think she is uh, someone that has talent, and I think that you know if if they're going to use her in this, let's see. I say it's great. She's awesome. She was awesome in Doctor Who. She's a great actress. I, I love that they're adding more star talent to Jumanji. All right. Well, thank you, Debbie, and thank you to everybody here joining us today on Collider Movie Talk. I want to give a huge shout out to everybody behind the scenes helping us out today, and of course the people up here on the panel with me. Let's start over there with the one, the only Miss Wendy Lee. Where can everybody find you online? On Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. Then we go to Big John Schnapp. Where can the kids check you out? You guys can find me on Instagram and Twitter, just at John Schnapp. And this coming weekend in Salt Lake City, that's right, the Salt Lake City Comic Con in Utah, Sweaties. Let's go. I'm at booth 2273. I'll see you there. Sweaties get salty. Uh, you can find Christian and I on the Schmodown this Friday announcing it. Where else can the kids check you out? Well, make sure, once again, that you submit your brackets, skdown2016 at gmail.com for a chance to win your prize after eight weeks tournament is over and i forgot to also mention that john schnepp and robert burnett aka team heroes will have Whoa. their first match in a couple of uh, right. about four or five weeks they'll be going up against mark riley and clark what? wolf the wolves of steel that's going to happen pretty soon so make sure you check <laughs> oh, that man. out but you know me, what it's like hey look you know I got to work with these people every week, you know. I don't want to create you know, like intense team rival no, rivalries no way, or anything, but we're going to destroy them. Whoa! Yeah. There, really, you go. there you go. There you go. This is one of those matches where the like the wheel in the second round can yeah. totally. If, if that wheel comes around in comic yeah. books, yeah, look right, well, that's, but that's, but that's in a little bit. An that's, enchanted spell from Doctor Strange will be on that wheel when we <laughs> it's play. Gonna be, it's going to hit superheroes <laughs> every time. Sorry. That's going to be fun. The team matches start pretty soon. Uh, second week of September is when the team matches will air. So follow me, Christian Harloff, Twitter and Instagram.
And lest we forget, the one, the only Miss Ashley Movo. Where can everybody find you? You're getting on my nerves again, Mark. Aww. You guys can find me on Twitter, Aww. Instagram, Snapchat, at Ashley Movo. Happy Tuesday, guys. Happy Taco Tuesday, indeed. Hey, New York City, got some really cool news coming to you guys very soon. Follow me on Twitter, at Mark Ellis Live. I want to give a huge shout out to amctheaters.com. That's where you go for all the latest box office and showtime ticket information. Check out collider.com. That's where we go for a lot of the stories we bring you guys each and every weekday. And of course, subscribe right here at Collider video on YouTube. My name is Mark Ellison. Until next time, have a great day. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Happy birthday, Luis. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.